Hello, this will be a quick wrap up of any cellular land far, far away. Organelles are in the cytoplasm and they perform functions within cells that are similar to how organs in the body perform functions within the organism. Remember that the cell is the smallest functional unit of life. The nucleus is the largest and most visible organelle within the cell and it contains our DNA. It's the control center. In eukaryotic cells, it contains DNA that we inherit from our parents and there's also DNA inside the mitochondria that we inherit from our mother specifically. Other organelles include that powerhouse, the mitochondria, which helps to make energy ATP molecule cells. And then the liasomes are like the Pac-Man. They eat, eat away the bad debris. And there's proteasomes, which function as the cell's digestive system. Ribosomes are important for protein so they are not surrounded by membranes and they are the cellular structures that make up the peanut butter or the protein to help make up other molecules needed for cell function. And then there are some other um, listed organelles here, but those are some really important ones that you need to be thinking about. In this figure, you can absolutely see all of the different parts and pieces and in some of the videos that I gave you these are this is the cell and these are the organelles within the cell. So the cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer that surrounds the cells and separates it from the surrounding external environment. The lipid bilayer gives a basic structure of the cell membrane and the proteins carry out most of the specific functions of the cell. Uh, the peripheral proteins function as receptor sites and signal molecules and transmembrane proteins to form transporters for ions and other substances. The cell is a self-sufficient structure that functions similarly to a total organism. In most cells, there's a single nucleus that controls the cell function and has the DNA, which provides the information to the different proteins that the cell needs to stay alive and to help us transmit the genetic information from one generation to another. The nucleus is also where RNA is made up and there's three types of RNA. There's messenger RNA and there is um, rRNA and then there's transporter RNA and that moves to the cytoplasm to make proteins. The cytoplasm contains the cell's organelles and cytoskeleton. Remember that ribosomes are like the peanut butter and those are the sites for protein synthesis in the cell. The endoplasmic reticulum transports substances from one part of the cell to another to make proteins for rough endoplasmic reticulum. The carbohydrates and the lipids, this happens in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The Golgi bodies are substances that modify and they're made in the endoplasmic reticulum, reticulum and package them into um, granules for transport within the cell or export them from the cell. The lysosomes are viewed as the digestive system along with the proteasomes, and they help to um, basically have an enzyme that digests worn out parts of the cell and foreign materials. Mitochondria is a very important piece because that is the powerhouse of the cell. It helps us to change ADP into ATP to power the cell activities, and it contains its own DNA, which is very important for making mitochondrial RNA and proteins used in oxidative metabolism or aerobic metabolism. The cytoplasm also contains microtubules, microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and thick filaments. The microtubules help determine cell shape and help the organelles move around in the cytoplasm, helps the cilia and chromosomes during cell division. And then another important piece is that actin myofilaments and the myosin thin filaments interact so that muscle cells can actually contract. Cells communicate with each other by chemical messenger systems. In some tissues, chemical messengers move from cell to cell through gap junctions without entering extracellular fluid. Other types of chemical messengers bind to the surface of intracellular receptors. 
three classes of cell surface receptor proteins are the G proteins linked, ion channel linked, and enzyme linked. G protein links rely on molecules called G proteins that work like an on and off switch to change external signals with first messenger and internal sec signals with second messenger. The ion channel link signaling opens or closes the channels formed in the cell membrane, and you can see this in the video in the club. Enzyme linked receptors activate intercellular enzymes and the receptors bind to DNA to change the protein synthesis. The life cycle of a cell is called the cell cycle. It's usually divided into five different phases. We've got the resting phase at G0, G1, where the cell begins to prepare for cell division, the S phase, during which DNA replication occurs, G2 is a pre-mitotic phase, G1, and then there's the M phase, and that's when mitosis occurs, cell division. And that's when a parent cell divides into two daughter cells and receives an identical pair of chromosomes. Metabolism is the process where carbohydrates, fats, and proteins from the foods we eat are broken down and changed into energy needed for cell function. The energy is converted to ATP, and that's the currency of the cell. The two sites of energy conversion are present in the cells with anaerobic glycotic pathways in the cytoplasm and aerobic or with oxygen pathways inside the mitochondria. The most efficient of these pathways is the aerobic citric acid cycle and electron transport chain within the mitochondria. This pathway requires oxygen and produces carbon dioxide and water as end products. The glycotic pathway in the cytoplasm involves the breakdown of glucose to form ATP, and this pathway can function without oxygen by producing lactic acid. Movement of materials across the cell's membrane is needed for survival of the cell. Diffusion is a process by which substances such as ions move down a concentration gradient from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Osmosis is the diffusion of only water molecules through a membrane down the concentration gradient for water from where water is more concentrated and there's fewer solutes to where water is less concentrated or where there are more solutes. Protein-assisted diffusion allows the small hydrophilic or water-loving substances such as ions or glucose to cross the cell's membrane with the assistance of a transport protein that spans the membrane, a channel or like a carrier protein. Active transport requires the cell to have energy to move substances against a concentration gradient from lower to higher concentrations. The two types that exist are primary and secondary, and both require carrier proteins. The sodium-potassium ATP pump is the best known active transport. Endocytosis is the process where the cells are engulfed by, and they engulf materials from the surrounding medium. Small particles are ingested with penocytosis, and then the larger particles are suggested or, excuse me, digested with phagocytosis, like the big Pac-Man. Some particles require bonding, and that's called receptor-mediated endocytosis. If exocytosis occurs, that's removal of large particles from the cell, and it's the reverse of endocytosis. Ion channels are an integral transmembrane protein that span the width of the cell, and they are either open or closed, and that's depending on the charge. Electrochemical potentials exist across the membrane of many cells in the body because there are higher concentrations of specific ions on either side of the cell membrane. So sodium, calcium, chloride ions are higher outside the cell, and potassium ions are higher inside the cell. When most cells are at rest, there is more negative charge inside the cell than outside, and the cell is said to be polarized. And this is established by the difference in electrical charge and chemical gradients. When cells are stimulated, ion channels can open or close, and that changes the ability for specific ions to be able to diffuse. Ion diffusion that causes the inside of a cell to become more positive causes depolarization, so the sodium or calcium ions diffusing into cells is an example. 
Ion diffusion causes the inside of the cell to become more negative and causes hyperpolarization or repolarization if the cell was first depolarized. In neurons, depolarizing graded potentials can stimulate action potentials to send signals to other cells. Changes in diffusion of ions across the membrane can sim stimulate signaling in other cells, such as muscles and glands. Body cells are organized into four basic tissue types. We have epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous. Epithelial tissue covers and lines the body surfaces and forms the functional components of glandular structures. We've got squamous, cuboidal, and columnar, according to the shape of the cells and the number of layers that are present. The cells in the epithelial tissue are held together by intercellular junctions. They can either be tight, adhering, or gap junctions. Connective tissue supports and connects body structures. This forms the bones in the skeletal system, joint structures, blood cells, and intercellular substances. Connective tissue can be divided into the loose or areolar, which fills body spaces. Adipose is fatty, and then reticular kind of makes the, the framework of many structures of the body. Dense can be either regular or irregular, and that forms things like tendons and ligaments and the dermis of the skin. Muscle tissue is a specialized tissue that can contract, and there are three types. We have skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Skeletal and cardiac muscle cells have actin and myosin and other proteins arranged to make striations under the microscope. Cardiac muscle cells are connected by gap junctions, and that allows ions to pass between the cells for contraction. Smooth muscles have actin and myosin in a different arrangement that is not striated, and this is smooth, and this is usually lining the inside of organs, like the stomach. Actin and myosin filaments interact to shorten the muscles in a process activated by calcium. In skeletal muscle, calcium is released from the sacro plasmic reticulum in response to an action potential. Smooth and cardiac muscles are often called involuntary muscle because they just do that. They contract spontaneously without us doing anything through the autonomic nervous system. The sacroplasmic reticulum is less defined and depends on the entry of extracellular calcium ions for muscle contraction. Nervous tissue consists of two cell types. We have the nerve cells called neurons, and we have glial cells, which is like the glue or the supporting cells. Nervous tissue is found throughout the body and is part of the body's communication system. The nervous system is divided anatomically into the central nervous system, which has the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which has the nerve tissue outside of the central nervous system. Nervous tissue is made up of neuron, neurons and glial cells and reacts to external and internal changes and communicates these throughout the body. The extracellular matrix is made up of a variety of proteins and polysaccharides, and the amount of makeup of the matrix varies with different types of tissues and their function. When confronted with a decrease in work demands or different environmental conditions, cells can atrophy or reduce their size and revert to a lower or more efficient level of functioning. If we have hypertrophy, this results from an e increase in work demands and is an increase in tissue size brought on by an increase in cell size and functional intercellular components, an increase in the number of cells in an organ or tissue that is still capable of mitotic division is called hyperplasia. Metaplasia occurs in response to chronic irritation and represents the substitution of cells of a type that is better able to survive under circumstances in which more fragile cell types might succumb. Dysplasia is characterized by deranged cell growth of a specific tissue that results in cells that vary in size, shape, and appearance. This is the precursor for cancer. Under some circumstances, cells may accumulate abnormal amounts of various substances and in a correctable systemic disorder such as hyperbilirubinemia that causes jaundice, the accumulation is reversible. If the disorder cannot be corrected, like in an inborn error of metabolism, cells can become overloaded and that causes cell injury and even cell death. 
pathologic calcification involves the abnormal tissue deposition of calcium salts. Dystrophic calcification occurs in dead or dying tissue. And although the presence of dystrophic calcification may only indicate presence of previous cell injury, it is also frequently the cause of organ dysfunction, so such as um, heart calcification with heart valves. Metastatic calcification occurs in normal tissue as the result of elevated serum calcium levels. In almost any condition, increases calcium can lead to calcification in inappropriate sites, such as the lung, the renal tubules, and blood vessels. Cell injury can be caused by lots of different things, including physical agents, chemicals, biologic agents, and nutritional factors. Among the physical agents that generate cell injury and mechanical forces that produce tissue trauma, extremes of temperature, electricity, radiation burns, or nutritional disorders. Chemical agents can cause cell injury through several different types of mechanisms. They can block enzymatic pathways, they can cause coagulation of tissues or clotting, or they can disrupt the osmotic or iconic ionic balance of the cell. Biologic agents differ from other injurious agents because they're able to replicate and continue producing injury. Among the nutritional factors, we've got excesses and deficiencies of nutrients, vitamins, and minerals. B12 was an example that I gave. Injurious agents exert the effects largely through generation of free radicals, production of cell hypoxia or loss of oxygen, and deregulation of intracellular calcium levels. Partially reduced oxygen species called free radicals are important mediators of cell injury in many pathologic condition. They are important because they cause cell injury in hypoxia and after exposure to radiation in certain chemical agents. Lack of oxygen underlines the pathogenesis of cell injury in hypoxia and ischemia, which is tissue death. Hypoxia can result from inadequate oxygen in the air, if there is cardiac disease, if there's anemia, which means we are lacking red blood cells, or the inability of the cells to use oxygen effectively. Increased intracellular calcium activates a number of enzymes with potentially damaging effects. Injurious agents may produce sublethal and reversible cellular damage, or they may lead to irreversible cell injury and death. Cell death can occur through apoptosis or necrosis. Apoptosis involves controlled cell destruction and is the means by which the body is going to remove and replace cells that have been produced by to excess. We have too many of them. They didn't develop correctly. They've got some genetic damage, or they're just simply worn out. Necrosis refers to cell death that is characterized by cell swelling, rupture of the membrane, and then finally inflammation. Like adaptation and injury, aging is a process that involves the cells and tissues of the body. A number of theories have been proposed to explain the complex causes of aging, including those based on evolution that explain the aging as a consequence of natural selection in which traits maximize the reproductivity capacity of an individual selected over those that maximize longevity. There's molecular theories such as those that explain aging as a result of gene expression, and then there's cellular theories that explain cellular science in relation to telomere length or molecular events, free radical damage, accumulated wear and tear, or apoptosis. Finally, systems theories attribute cellular aging to a decline in the integrative function of organ systems, such as the neuroendocrine and immune systems. Manifestations of acute inflammatory responses can be attributed to immediate vascular changes that occur. We have vasodilation and increased capillary permeability the influx of inflammatory cells, such as neutrophils, which are going to run to the site, and in some cases, the widespread effects of inflammatory mediators, which produce fever and other systemic signs and symptoms, like induration and inflammation. 
The manifestations of chronic inflammation are due to infiltration with macrophages, lymphocytes, and fibroblasts, leading to persistent inflammation, fibroblast proliferation, and even scar formation. Inflammation describes a local response to tissue injury and can present as either acute or chronic. The classic signs are redness, known as erythema, swelling, known as edema, local heat, pain, and loss of function. Acute inflammation is orchestrated by endothelial cells that bind the blood vessels, phagocytic leukocytes, which are mainly known as neutrophils, and then the monocytes, circulate in the blood and tissue cells. Macrophages and mast cells direct the tissue responses. Acute inflammation involves a hemodynamic phase, which blood flow and capillary permeability are increased in a cellular phase during which phagocytic white blood cells move into the area and engulf and degrade the agents. The inflammatory response is orchestrated by chemical mediators such as cytokines and chemokines, histamines, prostaglandins, complement fragments, and different molecules liberated by leukocytes. Acute inflammation may involve the production of different types of exudates containing serous fluid, which is kind of clear, which has white blood cells. If we have red blood cells or have a hemorrhagic exudate, it's known as sanguinous. If you put that together, you've got serosanguinous. Fibrinogen is a fibrinous exudate. It actually has fibrous tissue in it. And if you have tissue debris and white blood cell breakdown and have a very pus or white creamy looking type of exudate, then you have purulent exudate. In contrast to acute inflammation, which is self-limiting, chronic inflammation is prolonged and usually caused by persistent irritants, most of which are insoluble and resistant to phagocytosis and other inflammatory mechanisms. So it's when the body's, it's just something's not working. Chronic inflammation involves the presence of mononuclear cells, lymphocytes and macrophages, rather than granulocytes. Systemic manifestations of inflammation include the acute phase response, such as fever and lethargy, increased sed rate, and other acute phase proteins, leukocytosis, meaning they've got a high white count, and in some cases, you could have leukopenia if you're immune compromised. Enlargement of lymph nodes that drain into the affected areas are other examples of inflammation. Injured tissues can be repaired by regeneration of the injured tissue cells with cells of the same tissue or types of connective repair processes in which scar tissue is used to fill in the defect. Wound healing is impaired by conditions that diminish blood flow and oxygen delivery, restriction of nutrients essential for healing, and depression of inflammatory immune responses by infection, wound separation, foreign bodies, or aging.
The ability of tissues to repair damage because of injury depends on the body's ability to replace the cells and organize them as they were originally. Regeneration describes the process by which tissue is replaced with cells of a similar type and function. Healing by regeneration is limited to tissue within cells that are able to divide and replace the injured cells. Body cells are divided into types according to their ability to regenerate. We've got label cells such as epithelial of the skin and GI, which continue to regenerate throughout life. We've got stable cells such as those in the liver, which normally don't divide but are capable of regeneration when confronted with an appropriate stimulus. And we've got permanent or fixed cells, that's the nerve cells which are unable to regenerate. Scar tissue repair involves the substitution of fibrous, fibrinous connective tissue for injured tissue that cannot be repaired by regeneration. Wound healing occurs either by primary and secondary intention or tertiary and is commonly divided into an inflammatory phase, a proliferative phase, and a maturation or remodeling phase. In wound healing by primary intention, the duration of the phases is fairly predictable. We're basically going to just sew somebody up by primary intention. And in wound healing by secondary intention, the process depends on the extent of injury and the healing environment. Wound healing can definitely be complicated or impaired by factors such as malnutrition, restricted blood flow, oxygen delivery, a diminished inflammatory response, infection, wound separation, foreign bodies, nutrition. With infants and young children, wound healing is generally not impaired unless there's a hygiene issue. But adolescents tend to have dry skin and that can decrease the rate of wound healing. Older adults also experience dry skin and decreased sub-Q fat and that can increase the time of wound healing. So if we have Primary intention, this is a sutured surgical incision, that's an example. Larger wounds that have greater tissue loss, like past the sub-Q tissue, heal by secondary intention. And what this means is that it's going to have to, um, a wound that might have otherwise healed by primary intention may have become infected or popped open, and then it's going to have to heal by secondary intention. And the phases are the inflammatory phase and this is where maybe we've, we've got an injury and then we have a blood clot that migrates and then we have white blood cells that get into the wound site. Then the neutrophils come in and after about 24 hours they're joined by the macrophages which are going to help to continue digesting the debris and this helps with the production of growth factors for the proliferative phase. During this phase, we have new tissue forming. The key cell during this phase is the fibroblast. That's a connective tissue cell that synthesizes and secretes collagen. Fibroblasts are a family of growth factors that induce angiogenesis or new blood vessel growth and endothelial cell proliferation and migration. In proliferative phase, the final stage is epithelialization, and that's where the wound edges proliferate to form a new surface that is similar to what was destroyed. And finally, we have anywhere from three weeks to a year afterwards, we have a stage called the wound contraction and remodeling phase and this is where fibrinous scar tissue develops. There's a decrease in vascularity and continued remodeling of scar tissue and synthesis of collagen by the fibroblast and lysis by collagenous enzymes. And as a result of these two processes, the scar is capable of increasing its tensile strength and the scar shrinks and is less visible. But once we have a scar, when it's healed, the tensile strength will only ever be 80% of the pre-injury site. It'll never be 100% again.